Hello everyone, Josh here, and we're delighted to say that today's video is sponsored by Manscaped, but more on that later. The beauty of cinema, as with all art, is how differently we can all interpret it, bringing our own distinct experiences to the table which colour how we view a particular movie. Healthy debate about a film is, of course, a wonderful thing, though there are also cases where a large subset of viewers simply get the wrong end of the stick, a stick that's not as ambiguous or as up for debate as initially thought. So with that in mind, I'm Josh from WhatCulture.com, and these are 10 recent movie scenes everyone misunderstood. Number 10, the ending doesn't set up a sequel, The Matrix Resurrections. The Matrix Resurrections concludes with Trinity discovering her own one-like abilities and paying a visit to the villainous analyst along with Neo. They inform the analyst that as the Matrix ultimate power couple, they're going to rebuild it in their own image and then promptly fly off into the sky together, the end. Now, many viewers quite understandably assumed that the ending was sequel bait intended to launch a new trilogy of Matrix films, even if that couldn't actually be further from the truth. While doing press for the film, director Lana Wachowski was adamant that this will be her final Matrix film. And the movie itself not so subtly implies that she only came back in the first place to make it because Warner Brothers was going to reboot it without her otherwise. This was Lana's last big blockbuster swing by the looks of it, and so certainly where The Matrix is concerned. And given that actors Carrie Ann Moss and Keanu Reeves have made their loyalty to the Wachowskis clear, it's extremely difficult to believe that they return without the sisters being involved. Though it's at least easy to understand why some did feel like Resurrections' ending was teeing up more movies with Trinity and Neo, the best you can probably hope for is a reboot sometime in the future. But hey, at least The Matrix Rebooted is already the perfect title. Number 9. Diana didn't really eat pearls. Spencer. It's fair to say that audiences generally expect biopics to be rooted in a majority of truth. Though, as most of us know, it's extremely common for Hollywood to embellish what really happened for dramatic purposes. Yet, Pablo Lorraine's recent Princess Diana biopic, Spencer, unfolded as a far more surreal, dreamlike, even nightmarish piece of work, attempting to get viewers into Diana's fractured, anxiety-riddled mindset through an array of increasingly unsettling sequences. By far the most memorable moment in the film, though, occurs at a Christmas Eve dinner, where Diana destroys a pearl necklace given to her by her husband Charles, and then eats the pearls in her pea soup. Because Spencer was marketed as a more conventional, straightforward biopic, many audience members evidently took the scene at absolute face value and just assumed that it was actually based on a real-life incident. Yet this was entirely fabricated for the purposes of the film, intended to symbolize both Diana's increasing feelings of suffocation and having to abide by even metaphorically swallowed down royal traditions, and more literally by the eating disorder that she suffered with throughout her life. But because the trailers rather sneakily painted the movie as a more typical biopic rather than an experimental mood piece, some audiences went home thinking that Diana really did gulp down some pearls in her soup. Number 8. It doesn't prove that Thanos was right, Eternals. Eternals is by far the most divisive MCU movie yet, and prompted many fans to note that it seemed to be tactically supporting Thanos' decision to wipe out half of all life in the universe in Avengers Infinity War. That's because midway through the movie, it's revealed that the Earth's population has now reached a large enough number to provide sufficient energy for the celestial Tiamat to burst forth from the Earth's core, in turn destroying it. The implication, then, is that by snapping snapping half the universe for five years, Thanos inadvertently delayed Tiamat's emergence, halving the amount of energy on the planet and therefore keeping it at bay. Many quickly jumped on this and began flying the whole Thanos was right banner once again, even if that's a rather superficial, if not outright disingenuous reading of the movie. First and foremost, of course, Thanos buying the world five years of time was an accident byproduct of his genocide, which, any way you slice it, doesn't make his actions inherently correct, and certainly not from a moral perspective. But even if Thanos' snap had never been undone, it would have been a mere matter of decades before humanity's population did return to the necessary levels to facilitate the Celestial's birth anyway. And this is all without getting into the fact that while you would kill potentially billions of people with the birth of a new Celestial, on a cosmic scale, this is nothing compared to instantly eradicating 50% of living things in the entire universe. Number 7. No Big Deal – Spider-Man No Way Home 
Spider-Man No Way Home is full of references and Easter eggs to previous Webhead movies. However, there is one joke in there that's a little bit more loaded than the rest, and will go over the heads of all but the most online of movie fans. Following the Sony email hack back in 2014, the company's plans for the Spider-Man character in the Amazing Spider-Man universe were revealed, including notes from executives on how to make the hero more current with the kids. And as you can imagine, their ideas of hip are exactly what you'd expect from a bunch of middle-aged businessmen. One groan-worthy note suggested giving Andrew Garfield Spider-Man a catchphrase, that being, no big deal. The email went, quote, Millennial will often port NBD on their social media, as in no big deal, also known as the humble brag, wondering if uh, Spidey could get in on that somewhere, end quote. Now this could be referenced in a strange scene in No Way Home as some fans and outlets picked up on at the time. The scene in question is where Garfield's Peter 3 boasts that he can cure the lizard as he's done it once already. No big deal, he says, no big deal. Now, of course, this could just be a throwaway thing, but it's such a strange beat and weirdly lingered on that it's probably more likely a reference to this infamous executive note. Yes, yeah, so it's actually just much funnier if you do it in a shirt and a funny voice. Oh, wait, it's on, it's on. Hello. <clears throat> Oh, hello. Spokesperson for Scrotal Satisfaction, Josh Brown here. And if there's one thing we know at whatculture.com, it's balls. Ooh. And that's why we have, once again, partnered with manscaped.com to bring you their incredible performance package 4.0 bundle. I mean, look at it. Packaging and production design almost as sleek and as smooth as the downstairs regions of my colleagues. Almost. First, say hello to my little friend here, the Lawnmower 4.0. It's replaceable ceramic blades with skin safe technology and an LED light help you trim with confidence and see everything with perfect clarity. Too much clarity, some would say, but not me. It's also good for beard maintenance if you give it a clean and it comes with a wireless charging dock and a triple lock feature for when you're on the move. Three clicks and then you're good to go. Put simply, there'll be no more funny looks in the baggage claim when your bag is quote unquote acting weird. Out of the shower, the Crop Preserver Bold Deodorant has you covered for clear drying moisturizing that'll keep it downstairs fresh all day. And on the other ball, the Crop Reviver Bold Toner Spray with cooling aloe vera is there for your midday refresh. It smells like balls. For a limited time as well, you can get two free gifts with your order. The Shed Travel Bag and these Manscaped anti-chafing boxer shorts which just completely changed my life. Finally, sign up to the Peak Hygiene Plan to get replenishments of your favorite products delivered straight to your door, no fuss. So, what are you waiting for? Go to manscaped.com right now to get 20% off and free international shipping when you use our code WHAT20 at the checkout. That's the code WHAT20 when you check out. But for now, back to that video. Number six, Gurney isn't killed in the Harkonnen attack, Dune. Now, you'd admittedly know this one if you'd read Frank Herbert's source material, which, by the way, I absolutely have not, so spoilers here, I guess, for Dune 2. But in the first part of Denis Villeneuve's Dune adaptation, Paul Atreides' mentor, Gurney Halleck, just sort of disappears during the Harkonnens' climactic attack on House Atreides. Amid the carnage, we see Gurney running into battle with his fellow soldiers, and then that's it. Given that he's never seen again, many unfamiliar with Herbert's novel seem to just assume that the character perished in battle and wouldn't be seen again. Thankfully, that's not the case though. Without going into too much detail for those who haven't read the book or seen any of the prior adaptations, Gurney is still alive and will indeed be appearing in Dune Part 2. It is admittedly a bit of an abrupt end for the character, but conventional movie wisdom anyway says that nobody is really dead unless you see them die, so it shouldn't be that surprising that he's still alive and kicking somewhere. Number five, the ending doesn't set up Brian's return, F9. Nobody really expects to be confused by a Fast and Furious movie of all things, but the recent F9 did in fact leave audiences heatedly debating the precise meaning of its final scene. After Cypher has been foiled yet again and the family reunites for their traditional post-carnage barbecue, Dom and company turn their heads to see Brian O'Connor's iconic blue Nissan Skyline pulling into the driveway. This immediately prompted speculation among the fan base, with many believing that this ending implied that Brian would be making a return to the franchise in the upcoming two-part finale using similar VFX-driven techniques as were employed in Furious 7 following Paul Walker's tragic death. 
But that's absolutely not what F9's ending was getting at, like, at all. It's simply a sweet reminder that Brian still exists in this world and is living the good life as a committed father away from the danger of the family's globe-trotting shenanigans. Given that Brian has been quite sensibly kept in the background of the last two movies, it doesn't seem likely that we'll end up with an unnecessary digital Paul Walker rocking up for the 10th and 11th films. Number four, Leda is alive at the end, The Lost Daughter. Maggie Gyllenhaal's superb psychological drama, The Lost Daughter, ends with the troubled protagonist Leda being stabbed by young mother Nina and driving her car off the road and then heading down to the beach where she takes a phone call from her daughters. It's a seemingly ambiguous ending that has prompted audience members to debate whether Leda was in fact alive at the end or not. Those who believe she died from the stab wounds cite the fact that her daughters even mention her being dead on the phone. And the film ends with Leda miraculously discovering an orange in her hands, which she then peels in a snake-like motif, as she did for her children in their youth. While the source novel also plays Leda's fate as ambiguous, in this adaption she is 100% alive, as was confirmed by director Gyllenhaal in an interview with the Washington Post earlier this year. There she said, quote, If Leda dies, we're punishing her. It's not a punitive movie. It's not what we're doing. To me, this is a woman who is a hero, even though she is someone who has caused probably irreparable damage to both herself and her children, end quote. Now, that's a pretty definitive statement. Surreal though the ending might be, it's not intended to be the character's dying dream. She's still very much in the land of the living when the closing credits roll. Number three, yes, Peter killed Phil, the power of the dog. Jane Campion's a masterful Western drama, The Power of the Dog, is absolutely a film that rewards audiences who pay attention, right up to an ending that seems to heavily imply that Rancher Phil was secretly killed by his sister-in-law Rose's son, Peter. Phil swiftly succumbs to illness at the film's end, and though the doctor believes that he died of anthrax, his brother George is left shocked given that Phil's meticulousness meant that he always avoided handling diseased cattle. Yet earlier in the film, Peter gave Phil an animal hide with which to create a lasso, without informing him that it came from a dead animal, and in the final scene, we see Peter handling the same lasso with a pair of gloves. Furthermore, in the final scene, Peter smiles at his newly sober mother as she happily embraces George, seemingly relieved that the disruptive force that is Phil is now out of their lives. Though this ending seems relatively self-evident on paper, a quick Google search of the film reveals many viewers were left unsure about the precise meaning of its ending, and whether or not Peter did indeed kill Phil. And yeah, while this might seem obvious to some, Campion's film does move in a subtler rhythm than most casual viewers may be expecting from a Benedict Cumberbatch Western. But to clarify, Peter absolutely did kill Phil, and the original ending even hammered this point home by lingering on the definition of anthrax in Peter's medical textbook. Number two, Batman injects himself with adrenaline, not venom, the Batman. During the Batman's climax inside Gotham Square Garden, the kept crusader finds himself injured by one of the Riddler's followers, and in order to stop himself from passing out when Catwoman is attacked, injects himself with a mysterious green liquid. Now, many fans were quick to insist that Batman in this scene had actually injected himself with Venom, the green super steroid which has traditionally given Bane his enhanced strength in the comics. Hell, I even wondered this myself, considering just how weird the scene is in the final flick. However, it seems that we're looking too hard here for this to be some kind of interconnected comic book easter egg. The drug that Bruce consumed is clearly not as strong as Venom traditionally is, and while it's theoretically possible that this is a weaker proto version of the steroid, it's far more likely that it was simply supposed to be an adrenaline compound of some sort. Not everything is a wink-wink nod to the source material, even if director Matt Reeves could have admittedly avoided this confusion altogether by simply making the liquid any colour but green. Number 1. Vic is obsessed with snails because the author is. Deep Water. The new Ben Affleck and Anna de Armas starring erotic thriller Deep Water is truly one of the strangest and most mystifying films of the past year, and has left most viewers questioning what the hell was going on with all those damn snails. Protagonist Vic Van Allen, beyond being a violently jealous psychopath, has a bizarre fascination with snails, keeping dozens of pet snails in a series of tanks in a specifically designed room. 
despite an early implication that the snails might be used as poison later on in the film, they're ultimately a complete red herring, and seem to be a mere character flourish to assure the audience that Vic is a bit of an oddball. Now, viewers might also simply assume that the snails are supposed to possess some kind of purely symbolic quality as well, as at one point Vic does note that, quote, a snail will climb a 12-foot wall to find its mate, paralleling Vic's own possessiveness of his wife, Melinda. But there's actually an altogether different explanation for the snails' presence in the film. That being that Patricia Highsmith, who wrote the novel on which the film is based, was absolutely obsessed with snails in real life. During her life, Highsmith bred around 300 snails in the garden of her home, and even once famously attended a London cocktail party with a handbag full of 100 snails as her companions. I love that, I dig it. It's just, that's just a good vibe, isn't it? She also published the story, The Snail Watcher, focused on a snail-obsessed man, and saw the presence of snails in the film, a rather a peculiar homage to the author's own snail mania. So that's our list. I want to know what you guys think down in the comments below. What did you think about these movie scenes? And are there any misunderstood ones I missed off here? While you're down there as well, can you please give us a like, share, subscribe, and head over to whatculture.com for more lists and news like this every single day. Even if you don't though, I've been Josh. Thanks so much for watching, and I'll see you soon.